good evening ladies and gentlemen dear colleagues i am jubail islam joint secretary of dmps i am pleased to welcome you to the first webinar program of dmps now i would like to request to dr akhtarul zaman to conduct this webinar program society and we are planning to organize this kind of event every month at least one open year uh, in a month so during our activities every month uh, we will have one open year uh, and the speaker will be from home and abroad and today we are very pleased that uh, in the first open year we have the speaker from abroad Uh, he is a Bangladeshi born, but uh, currently he is working in Qatar as a senior medical physicist, uh, Mr. Abdul Sattar Khalid. And I would like to welcome him in this webinar. Before starting the webinar presentation, I would like to invite Mr. Shafiq Jamain, the vice president of Bangladesh Medical Physics Society. as he is the special guest of this webinar and i would like to invite you to uh, say something about this webinar mr shapayat please yes uh, thank you everyone thank you everyone this is safaiz zaman medical physicist at the department of research university dhaka medical college of medicine i am also working as a vice president of the bangladesh medical physics society uh, it's my pleasure to say a few words today uh, in this webinar and what i would like to say is you know, bangladesh medical physics society has been working immensely uh, for the development of medical physics in bangladesh and one of the aims of bmps since its formation is to develop medical physics community in bangladesh through various scientific programs um, and we have been working hard uh, continuously and this event is the continuation of that and as a part of that we have invited mr uh, Abdul Sattar Khalid who is the medical physicist at National Center for Cancer Care and Research Doha Qatar he would uh, share his experience on prostate cancer therapy today every year we organize different workshops seminars uh, scientific programs uh, in, in both nationally and also internationally uh, which is our uh, two yearly program that is the annual conference and also we celebrate the international day of medical physics on each se uh, 7 november every year and we publish our newsletter on that day also so as we all <coughs> excuse me as we are all aware of the current covid-19 situation it's quite difficult to organize a event uh, physically and i think this webinar is one of the solution uh, to that problem and to keep on practicing our scientific uh, scientific developments we have decided to host webinars every month so bmps would uh, like to host uh, webinars on different topics from different uh, researchers and experts like you all every month from now on But for that we would like your active participation not only as an audience but also as a presenter of your scientific research and studies we will circulate the news about the next webinar shortly um, you can hang on with us uh, to know about the future of webinar programs so we uh, 
I believe sharing knowledge will not only enrich oneself, but also it will help others to overcome any issues that we may have in our practicing centers. So I believe this platform has brought us all together in a single core with this time frame of the event from across the world sitting at the comfort of our home. I'd like to mention that brachytherapy has several applications depending on the sites. And based on that, we have different practices, but in Bangladesh, we mostly do the brachytherapy for cervical cancer. We have done some uh, figures, the uh, intraluminal brachytherapy, but still now we have not done any interstitial for prostate. But we have done uh, interstitial for some other sites. But, uh, and also I'd like to mention that in Bangladesh, we are not doing standalone brachytherapy. Maybe because of a large number of patients and huge, huge load for the doctors. Maybe for that. Also, we have got advanced case patients. So we are doing only boost dose for brachytherapy beside the EBR external beam radiation. So for today's topic, it would be quite interesting for all of us, I think. And uh, Mr. Uh, Khalid will uh, shortly share his experience with us on prostate factor. So I believe that's what, what all I had to say this evening. And I wish you all good health and stay home, stay safe. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, for your uh, for your nice speech. So at this stage, I would like to invite Mr. Abdul Sattar Khalid, the today's webinar speaker. He will speak about the HDR brachytherapy, especially for posted cases. It is not started yet. I mean, the interstitial, uh, interstitial brachytherapy is not started yet in Bangladesh. And we will have some insight uh, in his presentation. Please uh, welcome Mr. Abdul Sattar Khalid. Okay, Salam Alaikum, everyone, and hello. Thank you very much for having me here to present this. Thank you to the, to the organizers. Um, I'll share my screen and start my presentation if that's okay with everybody. Um, I'm not able to share my screen. Um, can the host help me with this? Sure. Ah. So whilst we wait for Jubairo to, to help ah. me with this part, Please, uh, please, uh, do, uh, will you share again? Okay, it's working now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so my name is Abdul Sattar Khalid. Um, I, I was born in the UK uh, to Bangladeshi parents, and I started my career in medical physics in, in the UK. And I'm currently working in Qatar as a medical physicist at the National um, Center for Cancer Care and Research. So I'm going to talk to you today about prostate brachytherapy, sort of a, an overview of the HDR treatment technique. And this is based on my experience and kind of an experience, a physicist perspective. Um, it's not going to go heavily into physics. It's not going to go heavily into planning. It's going to be more of an overview of, of the workflow, the kind of things we need to do, patient selection, etc. So just kind of a, a flavor of what is needed to be done and what to expect for a HDR treatment, you know. So the content of my, of my presentation, I um, broke it down into some parts. So I'll talk a little bit about the anatomy, uh, the function of the prostate. Um, I'll talk about the diagnosis of prostate cancer, how to stage, how doctors stage, and the management options, treatment techniques, how to, how to treat this type of cancer. And then I'll specifically talk about prostate HDR and I'll go into the equipment, the physics, the planning, 
kind of from from my experience and from what I what I've been exposed to. And I finish off with a with a kind of a small discussion just to kind of explain why brachytherapy is is particularly good for this for this kind of case and kind of how it can be good for other sites as well. So just to let you know, um, I used to work for the Christie in Manchester. That's where I spent most of my time. Um, so a lot of this experience is from the Christie, which is a, a massive brachytherapy centre in Europe. Um, I currently work at the, at the National Cancer Centre in, in Doha. Um, we do some brachytherapy here and looking into going towards doing prostate brachytherapy very soon. So uh, this, is just, this, is, this is my experience from Manchester. So we'll start off with the prostate. So the prostate is a, a walnut-sized gland which grows with age in men. It rests below the bladder and in front of the rectum and it surrounds part of the urethra. Um, and the urethra is a tube that carries the urine from the bladder. So it's in a critical position between the rectum, the bladder, and it has the urethra going through it. These are all critical structures that we need to be aware of when treating prostates. And one of the main functions of the prostate is to help create semen. So I'm going to show you a couple of images, pictures, diagrams, just to show you more clearly where, where things are. So in the center there, you can see labeled as a prostate, and you can see how the urethra passes through it into the bladder. And you can see how close the, the, the anus and the rectum is and where everything else is. This is an MRI scan just to show you the same thing again in a, in a more clinical kind of familiar um, setting. Sorry about the red lines. I don't know where those red lines have come from. Maybe I wrote something by accident um, when I started this video. Um, so you can see the prostate gland. You can see the, the urethra right in the center. So this patient has been positioned nicely when they were taking this image just to show you how, how everything looks. This is an ultrasound image um, showing you or trying to show you the prostate, the urethra and the blood and neck. Um, I apologize, it's not the greatest of images. However, in clinical settings, you can make these images look better with the appropriate lighting. Um, and actually, ultrasound is a good modality for this and I'll explain this a bit later on. So first of all, diagnosis. So this prostate cancer has become one of the most common cancers in, in the Western world, and I'm sure in the world itself. Um, it's because patients are, or men are living longer. The life expectancy has increased. And so as they get older, prostate issues seem to come, come, come along and seem to present themselves. And generally in the Western world, there's screening programs to, to, to look for patients who have this in early stages. Um, this may not be a factor all over the world, but screening is one of the, the big reasons for um, prostate cancer being quite prevalent. It presents in patients as urinary symptoms. So patients may have difficulty urinating, struggled urinating, leaking, etc. And the other thing is that they have a raised PSA. So PSA is something called the prostate-specific antigen, and it's a protein that is produced by the prostate gland itself. And raise there's a normal level found in normal men and then you can have raised levels and this is an indication of um, some issues with the prostate um, the PSA is also also useful for monitoring outcomes after treatment of prostate to see how it's coming back to normal levels or if it's being elevated once a patient is screened or once a patient is presenting with symptoms and um, has been diagnosed to have a form of prostate cancer. The next part of it is staging, um, finding out how aggressive the cancer is, how localized the cancer is, or what spread. So the staging work is carried out using MRI, transrectal ultrasound biopsy, or bone scan, or a combination of these things. And when I talk about staging, we talk about the TNM staging, the tumor node metastasis staging. And this describes um, the location within the prostate, how aggressive the cancer is, which side of the prostate. Um, it's, very, it becomes, it's more of a t technicality for doctors. Um, I'll explain. So depending on the staging, um, the patient can be classed as either low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. So the risk groups here. So you can see the low, the low risk groups are your TNM staging from T1C to T2A. And the the PSA level, usually given in nanograms per liter, is less than 10. There's something else mentioned here known as the Gleason um, score. 
So the Gleason score is the evaluation of the, the cells under microscope after biopsy. Um, depending on how they look on the biopsy, I've just put a little diagram here for you just, as a, as a, just to see what they look for. Depending on the type of cells the, the, the pathologist sees, the, the Gleason score is higher or lower. So it kind of describes how aggressive the tumor is, how aggressive the cells are, how much they may spread, how much they may spread into other organs, etc. So the risk groups are set um, from PSA, Gleason, and TNM. And you can see intermediate risks, PSA between 10 and 20, Gleason 7, and the TNM is T2B to T2BC. Um, and the high risk is anything more than 20 on the PSA, Gleason from 8 to 10, and anything from T2 to T3 stage cancer. And the thing to note is the prognosis with prostate cancer is variable and it depends on the grade of tumor and the stage of disease. So these things need to be taken into consideration when considering the treatment options for these patients. So the treatment options, um, depending on what stage these patients are, which, which risk category these patients are, um, there's, these are the kind of usual um, treatment options. So there's watchful waiting. This essentially means nothing is done for the patient however they're monitored over a period of time but this this is usually the case for maybe low risk patients where they are not having um massive symptoms they, they the patients can go about their everyday life and sometimes it can be that the patient prefers this because of um, elderly age or other worries um the other the other thing to do is surgery to remove the prostate or to remove the disease from the patient and this also depends on the patient um suitability um the other thing that we know of are obviously radiotherapy that's um, external beam radiotherapy low dose rate seed radiotherapy bracket therapy and the high dose rate bracket therapy for the prostate there's hormone treatments that you can give to reduce the size of the prostate perhaps sometimes hormones are, are given in conjunction with therapy to reduce the size of, of the prostate. Um, other options can be cryotherapy or high food. High food is high intensity focused ultrasound. And I guess these are depending on where, where you are in the world and the availability of such um, treatments. So it could be a combination of everything is available, patient suitability, or it could be that what, what is available in, in, in the part of the world you're in. I put this diagram in to show you um, how how pa how patients kind of should be evaluated for the type of treatment that I mentioned before. Um, so, so like surgery, brachytherapy, brachytherapy with external beam radiotherapy therapy or external beam radiotherapy therapy alone. And you can see things like the, the patient age has a massive um, impact on what you choose. Uh, so for a patient who is very elderly, over 75, they would not go for prost prostatectomy or surgery. Um, High-risk cancer, for example, the only real option is external beam radiotherapy, um, perhaps brachytherapy with EBRT. Um, and you can see low-risk cancer um, <laughs> surgery is, 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 is preferred. You need to think about other factors as well. So what, what other comorbidities the patient has, you know, um, health condition, obesity, previous disease, etc. So the HDR selection, uh, selection criteria. So the patient must be fit for anesthetic. Um, with, this, with this type of treatment, the patient is under general anesthetic, so they must be fit enough to be able to, to, to undergo this, this procedure. Life expectancy must be greater than five years, and the risk status of the patient must be intermediate to high risk. And the other thing is that the, the, the actual tumor, the cancer, should, needs to be histologically confirmed to be within the prostate itself. So this must be performed using biopsy or MRI. And the clinical staging, it should be as stated here. And the disease, disease confined to the um, seminal vesicles if stage T3B. PSA less than or equal to 50. Uh, there needs to be a bone scan or MRI staging to help um, assess all these things. And there must be no previous TURP. So that's transurethral re um, recession of prostate. So like um, some patients may have their prostate removed using this, this, um, this technique. There isn't any particular volume constraints, but in my experience, I've not seen a patient who had a, a volume of more than 60 centimeter cube. Generally, the, the, the volumes we saw lay between 20 and 60. Um, 
because if they were any bigger in the bone scan and MRI staging, they generally are sent for hormones to help reduce the size of the prostate because you have issues such as um, pubic arch interference. So going on to HDR treatments. So there's, there's, I don't, there's three ways that centers usually or play, the, the, the brachytherapy community usually delivers this type of treatment. There's the HDR boost, which is in combination with the external beam radiotherapy. And you have the, the HDR salvage um, prescription, which is for patients who have previously had external beam radiotherapy um, and there has been recurrence and they've come back. And then there's this new concept of HDR monotherapy, which is just HDR on its own. Um, I'll discuss these a little bit later. In my presentation and my experience, I, I, I have uh, planned and treated patients with um, the, the CCTG adopted by the Christie. So that's the, the Canadian Clinical Trials Group um, HDR boost technique, which is um, external beam radiotherapy of 37 and a half gray in 15 fractions and a boost of 15 gray. Um, one fraction HDR radiotherapy. So in my experience, we do the single fraction first um, of HDR, and then the patient has external beam radiotherapy two weeks later. And it can or it can or not include the seminal vesicles. And from my experience, from the point of probe in, so that's when we say when the ultrasound probe goes into the patient after the patient is anesthetized, and to the point where we say beam off, technically when the radiation is removed, uh, it's approximately two to two and a half hours, depending on the strength of the source, depending on the time of uh, time of uh, between when the source was installed and when it's removed. So if it's, if it's an old source, it can take maybe three, three and a half hours. But the average time was about two and a half hours. After the patient is, has this treatment, the patient is followed up at the radiotherapy planning scan. So that's um, the two weeks after the boost, the, the HDR, the, the patient is comes back for radiotherapy and they have their planning plan. So we assessed the size and, and that, the kind of stuff at that time. Um, there's a, there's a follow-up on six weeks after the external beam. And then after that, there's a three monthly follow-up to see how the patient is doing and how the, the you know, um, toxicity, et cetera. And these are assessed using quality of life, um, IPSS and these other acronyms as you can see. So quality of life, IPSS is, is like an international prostate um, symptom score, which is a questionnaire that is given to the patient and depending on how they are feeling for the certain questions, they come out with the score. So moving on to the equipment. So for the equipment, you need the, the transrectal ultrasound um, equipment uh, in order to be able to, to, to image the patient. You need a template and needles which are attached to this um, setup. You need a stepping stepper device which should be connected to the planning system and should be able to index where you are within the patient. So everything has to work together essentially. So as you move through the patient with your ultrasound probe, you should know where you are, how much you are coming in or out of the patient in order to be able to localize um, the treatment. And of course, you need the afterloader, which is which is the key thing here, the high dose rate brachytherapy afterloader. Um, my experience is with Iridium 192, but I'm sure there's there's other people here may, who may have other experiences, such as with cobalt sources. Um, there's you need the you need the integrated ultrasound planning system. Um, so this is this is essentially the ultrasound unit and the planning system all in one go, which is taken into theatre. Um, this is just an example of the ultrasound you can have as well. These are just, just some pictures of, of some equipment that we've used in the past. So just to clarify, all these pieces of equipment are in the theater with you at the time of implantation and dose delivery. Um, I must mention one thing. Um, so there's CT-based CT -based HDR and there's ultrasound-based HDR. So they both do the same thing, but the difference is that for a CT-based HDR prostate treatment, the patient, once they are anesthetized and um, needles are inserted, they need to go to, they need to be moved to CT in order for the images to be taken. Um, the ultrasound-based technique, which is what I'm talking about here, which is what I have experience with, is a bit more slick. There's no need to move the patient. You can image the patient there and then, and so it, it removes the uncertainty of any patient changes, anatomy changes, et cetera. And I think in the, in the radiotherapy community, 
over the years, people are moving more towards this real-time ultrasound imaging technique over the CT. Um, this is some pictures of the stepper. Hello, the excuse me, Khaled. Yeah, sure. Just a quick question. Can we use an ordinary ultrasound machine or can we configure with the treatment planning surface or do they have the designated ones? Um, I think there is, from my experience, you can use your existing um, ultrasound machine if it can be incorporated with your planning system. So the thing is the planning system itself needs to be in the room with you. So the planning system is on a standalone unit and they have a connectivity where the, your, your probe can go into this and it can, you know, there's an encoder. I don't know, it depends on your model. It depends on how new or old your model is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. my question, yeah, my question is that can we configure the ordinary ultrasound machines in the radiology for this purpose? I mean, are this completely separately manufactured? And I mean, the customs? Usually, usually knowing how the manufacturers work they like to have specific units for this kind of things because you know it's, it's they need to make some money uh, configuring may be possible but i don't know in my experience i've never seen configuration like this take place it may be very difficult um, especially with how they fit into the stepper how how you're able to encode the images into your planning system because the planning system and the and the imaging system need to talk to each other to know exactly where you are inside the patient so it may be difficult I can't really comment on that. All right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So carrying on with this. So the images here show you the stepper grid probe assembly, and you can see there's a there's a coordinate system um, on the grid itself. So and this coordinate system corresponds to the planning system coordinate system. So when where you are placing a needle physically, it will correspond to to where you are internally and on the software. And there's a three millimeter alignment accuracy with the software. Um, Consideration needs to, take, to be taken for needle type, um, metal or plastic. This may depend on your imaging system, how you image. My experience is with metal trocar needles, which are hollow needles that are pushed into the patient, and the central trocar is removed, and the HDR back therapy unit is connected to this hollow needle so that the, 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 seas, the iridium source can pass through. Um, so, yeah, you need to think, in terms of needle type, you need to think about the, the, the material and depending on the material to think about what will happen to your image quality and how to ha, what to expect on the images when these needles are pressed inside the patient so move, I'm going to move on to workflow now just to give you an idea of what what to expect so before the planning before the planning the patient is anesthetized and let's assume at this point the patient has been anesthetized they're under GA and they are in the lithotomy position ready to be to be to, for the for the process to start. So before planning, the probe, the ultrasound probe, is pushed into the patient, and we say the base is set. So you make a reference point point where the base of the prostate is set in the imaging system. So you know this is the zero plane, perhaps, and this is where the base of the prostate is. And as you step out, you know how far you're stepping out because you either do it in two millimeter slices or three millimeter slices. So setting the base is very important after setting the base you insert four needles so this is bear in mind this is my experience we insert four needles and the idea to insert the four needles is to to anchor the prostate down because as you push the needles in the prostate moves um superiorly into the patient and inserting the four needles in the beginning anchors this and stops it in in the subsequent needles from push, pushing any further. So the most of the movement will happen in the first four needles. After the needles are inserted, you need to reset the base because the prostate will move slightly. So then we move on to what, what I call the pre-planned stage. So after these four needles are inserted, the base is reset, we acquire the ultrasound images. So we step out of the patient in three millimeter slices, acquiring images, kind of like a, how we do in the CT, but with the ultrasound. So we can get a, like a 3D um, picture of how the prostate looks, how the urethra looks, um, and where the rectum is, etc. Once the ultrasound images are acquired, the contouring takes place. The doctor contours the prostate, what they can see, um, the rectum, the urethra, and they're the, they're the main things. The bladder is behind the prostate, and we... we when setting up the patient, we ensure that the, the bladder is behind the prostate and we ensure that the needles don't go further too far to pierce the bladder. 
we produce something called a pre-plan after contouring. So this is like um, uh, an ideal plan. So this is where you place needles um, in places to get a sufficient dose distribution. Um, we call this the pre-plan because this plan is what you want to do. So where you want to put the needles. So this takes a bit of technique. It takes a bit of practice and experience, knowing how to put the needles into the patient, where to put the needles in, how to space them, etc. cetera. Um, once you've produced this pre-plan, the doctor then inserts the needles into these positions as, you, as I tell them. So for example, you saw this grid that I showed before. Um, I would tell the doctor to place the needle into, for example, little C1. Then the, the doctor will push the needle into little C1. And as they insert the needle, I, as the planner, I will guide them. Sometimes they may be too low, too high. Sometimes the needle may not be going in parallel. So you guide the doctor. So once all the needles are placed inside the patient, we go to what we call the live planning part of this. So again, you acquire the ultrasound image because now that all the needles have been placed inside the patient, the, the, the images will change. The, the prostate may have moved slightly more. There may be some swelling due to some bleeding. So we acquire the ultrasound images and then we contour again. So the doctor will contour again. So based on the contours they have before, they will adjust contours in case of any swelling, any movement, etc. One thing to bear in mind is we always ensure that the urethra stays in the center and we always ensure that there's no needles going through the urethra because this is the catastrophic. Um, after the con second contouring, we do something called needle reconstruction. And in my opinion, in my experience, needle con reconstruction is probably the most important part. And this is because in this part of the process, we are telling the system exactly where the needle is. And if we, move, if we remember what we created in the pre-plan, the needles won't be exactly where you plan them. There will be some changes because it's very difficult to make it go inside the patient accurately. So the needle, needle reconstructions need to be accurate. A check needs to take place by a second person, a second physicist perhaps, to make sure that how you reconstruct it is correct. Um, and then you create the plan. After the needle reconstruction is done, you create the plan. And the plan creation, I will talk about a bit later, um, how we do this is pretty straightforward. And once this plan is created, the plan is checked by another physicist, uh, another person. Um, it's approved by the doctor if they're happy with the coverage, um, the sparing, etc. We do the pre-treatment checks. The pre-treatment checks, again, are very important. And in this case, these will be things like the number of needles, um, the connection from the afterloader to the needle, are they accurate? Is the needle one going to the position one on the afterloader, etc.? And we also measure something called the free length. So every needle that has been inserted into the patient is measured. The, the needle that part that is sticking outside the patient. And this allows us to know how much of the needle is inside. These numbers are put into the planning system to finalize the, the treatment. So the ultimate thing is knowing where the source is going. This is why needle reconstruction and these measurements are very important. Once all these things are done, pre-treatment checks are finalized. Everybody is happy. The doctor is happy. Everyone moves out of the room. Um, radiation protection rules are adhered to and the treatment starts. This is an image just to show you um, a schematic drawing, just to show you how, how it looks when the patient is being treated. So you have the probe inside the patient at all times. So you can image at any moment. Although you have your acquired images, you can also image as you are pushing this needle into the patient to make sure you're going in the right place. This is an example of the on central treatment planning system, what I used in the past at the Christie, just to show you what we are looking for. I explained before the ultrasound images look terrible to the, to, at first to the naked eye. Um, but with experience, you can see that these images are more than sufficient for what we need to do. The, this is after we acquired in the first stage and the, the doctor, they contoured the prostate, which is in red. The purple shows the urethra and the blue shows the rectum. So, after this stage, this is what I, this is what I was explaining about um, the pre-plan where I decide where to put the needles. These, in the center, you can see four needles here. Um, these are the initial needles I put in. They, I know these needles are already there. And then I decide where to put the needles in, in an arrangement that I feel comfortable with. And again, this arrangement comes with experience doing these uh, often, knowing where to put them, how quickly to put them. And once I decide this, this setup, then we move to push, pushing the needles in. So this image 
is trying to show you the needles as they are inside. You can see the, the, the kind of light um, shading where the needles have been pushed in. So in this view, you can see them and you can see the, the artifacts that are created by, by these metal needles in those sound. So this is what I mean by it's very important for needle reconstruction. And you can see in this sagittal um, view, the needles and you can see they, they are you know like they, they're not exactly parallel to the to the prostate it depends on the skill of the doctor it depends on the timing etc it takes time and so i must make sure that when i reconstruct this needle i re reconstruct the path exactly as i see it and you can see there is there's an artifact here you can see this this needle looks like it's split into three so it takes some skill and some practice and uh, um some time to to know how to differentiate between what is artifact, what is what is real needle. So it's very important at the needle reconstruction stage. Okay, after this, we, I talked about the optimization. So optimization, very straightforward prostate HDRs. Um, you can do an inverse DVH-based optimization, a very simple, straightforward way of telling the system, okay, I want to cover the prostate with this dose, I want to um, avoid this dose to rectum, and then the program, you, you click go and it quickly produces something. The idea is that it changes dwell positions within those pathways, within those needles to give you what you wanted. It's very straightforward. From my experience with Oncentra, I start with inverse DVH based optimization, then I adjust it manually. So you can manually adjust um, times of the dwell positions in case you see that there is some dose going somewhere you don't like. There's another thing called graphical, so you can actually physically move the isodosis. Depending on your, comf your, your, your experience or your, your confidence, it's up to you how you want to do this. The main thing is to produce a plan which meets the DVH constraints, which I'll show you on the next slide. On this slide, it just, it's just showing you the dose distribution in a, in a color wash to show you kind of, the kind of dose distributions we expect. And it's just showing you where the dwell positions that the, have been planned to be. So you can see like we, we are avoiding the urethra as much as possible. We never put any needles in this central plane here because we don't want to pass through the urethra. So the DVH constraints we want for a prescribed dose of 15 gray. And we want D90% to be greater than 90%. We want the volume receiving the 100% IC dose to be more than 95%. So we want, it's a similar kind of thing to external beam, really. The only difference is here, the dose escalation. So you can see we, we allow 150% dose, we allow 200% doses. However, we make sure that the volume um, receiving 150% is less than 35%. The volume receiving 200% is less than 15%. Um, and you can see, if you look at these IC doses, you can see where these, where these, um, where these are. So... If you know the patient's diagnosis and you have the reports there about where this tumor is localized, for example, depending on the stage, it may be in one half or the other half, you can concentrate the needles in one section more than the other. And in some instances where it's difficult to push the needle into the patient, if you, are, if you and the doctor are confident that one lobe hasn't got the disease, then you may be able to compromise in that region. Um, so these decisions come when you are planning and with all the information in hand. The, the, the important thing to realize here is that urethra, the D10% must be less than 115%. So 115% IC dose, you can see looking at this kind of pinkish line, is away from this urethra. And the rectal Dmax has to be less than 13.5 gray. So the staff roles, generally, from my experience, um, there's about four to six people involved. So you have the physics and you have depending on which part of the world you're in, you have physics or you may have specialist radiographers. So we, in the crystal, we had very specific trained radiographers who would be involved with planning and checking, very senior, senior level. Um, you need doctors to contour, um, to push the needles in and for plan approval. And we used to have a, a spe specific prostate brachytherapy consultant radiographer who operated the ultrasound and patient positioning, etc. But these can all be done by doctors um, who are appropriately trained. Um, the physics staff uh, were there for treatment throughout the whole thing. So from, from the initial kind of planning to the treatment delivery. The other thing to note is you also need an anesthetic team um, as the patient will be on the GA. So I haven't mentioned these people here. Um, as as um, standard, there will be QA performed from physics before um, uh, during and perhaps after, depending on the setup that you have. So the physics key things to know, equipment. 
So one thing to note is that the treatment planning system that you use, whatever it may be, um, my experience is with Oncentra. I know there's other manufacturers out there. Generally, the, as far as I'm aware, the TG43 dose calculation algorithm is used in brachytherapy in all of, most of these systems. And this assumes an infinitely large water phantom. So there's no heterogeneity con corrections. It's just something to note. So, for example, the needles themselves, there's no, the, the, the system isn't, thinking that these are needles it just assumes everything is water it just things to bear in mind when creating the plan or the kind of plan you get at the end how how uncertain it is or these things need to be thought about the ultrasound used for imaging this is vital the probe and grid setup is vital it needs to be accurate it needs to be set up correctly the screws need to be done correctly and as this is in a theater environment from what i'm used to you need to be in a theater theater kind of you know um scrubbed up in gowns, etc. So it can be difficult screwing little screws, etc. So it's important to have these properly set up and properly checked by a second person. Um, it's just everything needs to be considered how to QA these things, how to QA grids, etc. All to make sure that during the procedure itself, nothing goes wrong. And if anything does go wrong, things are in place to make sure replacement grids, replacement needles, things may break, things may be dropped, etc. And as it's a sterile environment, these things need to be thought about. Planning. Physics key things to know for planning. So there isn't any sort of standard needle arrangement. It's, it depends on the patient. It depends on the shape and size of the prostate, whether urethra is, where the rectum is. Every patient is different. And in my opinion, in my mind, as I, I, I did this treatment in, at the Christie for four or five years, and we did a lot of treatments. We did six or seven patients a week. So... I built a quite a big bank of knowledge. And in my mind, I had an idea of where I would put the needle. But I, honestly speaking, every patient was slightly different and every patient um, presented their own challenges. So it means like some, some patients' rectum contours may be too high, maybe too low. The urethra may not be as straight as I wanted. So it depends. Um, you will often need more needles on the posterior edge to, to make sure you can scope the dose around the rectum better. And you also have to think about at the beginning, once the first images are taken, you need to think how this prostate may change after all the needles are positioned in, depending on the patient themselves. Because if you don't think about that, the initial plan that you have may or will change significantly and then you, you won't be prepared for how to, how, to, how to manage this. So you need to have a think about those kind of things. Um, like I said earlier, needle reconstruction is very important as it determines the location of dual positions because this is, in my opinion, one of the most, probably the most important thing. If I'm reconstructing the needle wrong, then I don't know where this, this, this um, radioactivity is going. This is, this is extremely important to check and extremely important thing to, to have in your QA. So any questions before I move on to discussion? Anybody have any uh, questions before? Yes, yes, excuse me, Khalid. Uh, I have a question about the needle reconstructions. Like, okay. uh, obvious, obviously, the ultrasound is uh, giving us the IGBT, that is image guidance. And uh, for the transverse, uh, the transverse uh, angle, like uh, when reconstructing the needles, yeah. uh, is it quite difficult? Uh, because uh, the ultrasound, it is only... Um, giving us the, in the rectum right so the yes so needles it is are in a series and the needles which are in series how do you plan for those so this, this is a very good question because this is the thing this this is a very good point you made there as so the needles that come closer to the crystals create the most um, artifacts so there's a, there's a technique to try and avoid this as much as possible so we start and pushing the needles in from the top side from the top left of the grid um, I don't have an, uh, I should have, let me, let me see if I can. So let's, for example, in this picture on the top left um, diagram, you can see the needles. So we will start with inserting needles from this coordinate. I will move back like this to the bottom. So it means that the, the artifact, the, the worst artifact will be created by the needle closest to the ultrasound probe. So if I start here, then I can see, I can progressive, I can see these better as I go down. You understand what I mean? So inserting them in a specific particular order helps to mitigate this. It doesn't remove this artifact issue fully, but it helps mitigate this so you are more certain where the needle is going. In, in, 
in regards to me to reconstructing, the same thing is what I employ. I start off in the top left when I'm reconstructing because these are the most difficult needles now because the artifact from the below will be propagating above. So I start from this and you spend a lot of time. In this whole process of two and a half hours, I, I think I spend approximately 45 minutes doing this part alone. So it takes a long time. Um, the best thing to do, what I do in the past is I have a second person there, a second physicist there, as I am doing this. So um, in case I am looking at, so I, it is subjective, but having a second a trained person help to remove the subjectivity slightly. So you can, in some situations where the artifact is particularly bad, you have to go with the most sensible approach. Now, if the artifact is too bad, which I have had in one occasion, I decided not to use this needle at all because the uncertainty for me was too high. So it is a decision you need to make as you are planning. So this is what I mean by expect surprises when, when you're planning these. On a, on a normal, on a good prostate plan, you will have artifacts, but you will be able to mitigate this by a second person and spending some time. Worst case scenario, you don't use this needle. So you need to talk to the doctor and see what the, the result of not using this needle may be. Maybe I can um, avoid using this needle because I don't need it. Or maybe that you need to use this needle. However, it is very far from the urethra, from the rectum, from the bladder. So the uncertainty is it going to have such an effect on the dose delivery? These decisions need to be made depending um, on the situation. But as experience grows, you, you learn how, how to manage these things. Do you understand what I mean? Yes, obviously. Uh, thank you. And uh, don't you think that CT images would uh, help a little bit on that? Of course. CT imaging will be much better in image quality. However, what you need to understand is once you, you insert the needles in one room, in one theater, and then you move the patient to the CT. Now, depending on where your CT is, it may be close, it may be far. For sure, patient anatomy, the patient, something will change. So now you need to think about the uncertainty of this compared to the uncertainty of the, of the needle reconstruction and see which one is, is the minimum. And I think a lot of people and a lot of exp experienced people are moving more towards the, the ultrasound because as they gain experience, they notice that it is, a, it is minimal. The reconstruction okay. error is more minimal than the, the movement okay. error. Okay. So moving on to discussion. So why brachytherapy is a question. So the main thing is that you get a highly conformal dose delivery um, with this technique and with a high dose perfraction. And as studies have gone on about high perfraction, the benefits of high perfractionating for prostates, I think prostates uh, are known to have a low alpha beta ratio or have been shown to have a low alpha beta ratio. And recent studies and studies over the years are showing that escalating the dose in the prostate shows good outcomes, disease-free survival. So brachytherapy is a good way of producing this because there is no, even in VMAT, you cannot sculpt the dose away from the OARs as much as you can from the brachytherapy. And the biggest thing this is the inverse square law. Um, dose escalation has shown to improve disease-free rates for prostate cancer. And external beam alone can result in insufficient dose to within the dominant lesion. And I, I read some, I can give you some references later, but studies have shown that patients that have shown um, kind of failure have mainly been mainly to do with external beam therapy not being sufficient. In, in the other benefits are real-time imaging and adaptation. So as the prostate changes to when you to when you treat, you can see how the prostate is changing. You can account for this. You can account for the dark conditions. You can stop the growth. But this kind of stuff is very difficult to do in external beam because in external beam, external beam alone, if you're creating a plan, you're creating a plan for 30 fractions, 20 fractions. And although you may be doing image guidance day to day, it's, it's still very difficult to adapt the plan to an, that extent. Um, the, the, the one of the other things that I've been thinking about recently being in Doha is that combining EBRT with, with uh, brachytherapy boost it results in fewer visits for the patients. So I know centers still carry out the old 78 gray in 30 fractions, I think it is not all centers have moved towards the chip trial of 60 and 20. So it means patients are having external beam for, for three to six weeks. With brachytherapy, your, the patient, especially for, for boost, the patient will only be having three weeks of external beam and then one session or maybe two sessions of brachytherapy and everything is done. 
So you're having your, your LINAC time is more free. You can use the LINAC for other treatments, especially in situations in certain parts of the world where there aren't enough LINACs. There's not enough linear accelerators for cancer treatments. You can free up time because prostate treatments seem to take many fractions. So if you, if you treat, I don't know, five prostate patients in, in any given week, they, they, their treatment will be done in three weeks rather than six weeks. Then you have three weeks for other treatments. It's just thinking about it in that sense. The other thing to, to understand is many papers have come out and the American Brachytherapy Society um, specifically looks at these um, toxicity and survival of these patients. And it's shown that for intermediate and high-risk patients, you're looking at 81 to 100% um, control rates. So local control rates of up to 100% for, for those patients studied. So it's a very, very good technique used in conjunction with external beam radiotherapy. Okay, so f I'm just going to tidy up. This has become quite a long talk. So the future, what does the future hold? So there's, there's been some work going on for monotherapy, so the, where there's no external beam radiotherapy at all. Some centers have been doing, I, I was involved with this for a short time at the Christie, where we were delivering 19 grain, one fraction alone in HDR brachytherapy. Um, there is some, some issues with the, with the data that has been showing quite severe toxicity. So there's not a massive consensus there yet, but there's work being carried out for monotherapy alone. There's, to, there's also studies going on for, for low to intermediate risk patients. Instead of giving those patients LDR, low dose rate seed implants, um, one or two fractions of HDR. So this is an ongoing thing. Um, other things we can consider is zonal coverage. So we can deliver high and very specific dose to specific areas of the prostate rather than the whole prostate with, with brachytherapy. Um, and also there's work in salvage HDR for recurrent disease. So this is, this is pre, from pre, if the patients had previous brach, um, external beam or previous brachytherapy CD implantation. So these patients, we can control where to give the dose. And this, these are also mentioned in the, the ABS guidelines. Just a quick slide on some recommendations, some places that I look at and have been referring to. So because I was trained in the UK and most of them, and most and if all of my brachy prostate um, experiences in the UK, I use the Jack Castro guidance quite a lot. I looked at the ABS uh, and in terms of dosimetry and QA, the IPEM, IPEM is a UK, UK guidance um, that I use quite a lot, um, especially IPEM report 81. IPEM report 81 covers quite a lot of radiotherapy in general, but it's very good for HDR dosimetry and QA. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead. Uh, Khalid, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Okay. The, the first question is that we are in a process of starting the, the brachytherapy, but we have involved uh, um, urologist. So in your staff, I haven't seen anything. Any? Are you, is, it, is it necessary to involve any urologist? During this um, procedure, in, in my center, in my previous center where I used to work at the Christie, we had a we had a long history of brachytherapy. Um, we did have urologists involved to, at the beginning, um, but not for the actual HDR um, treatment itself. Um, I'll have to look into that because I like I have been in Doha for nearly a year, so it's been some time since I've done prostate. So I'll have to revisit my notes. Maybe I can give you a bit more explanation on that. Um, via oh, yeah, email, thank perhaps. you. I got it. Now, secondly, regarding this uh, contouring, once you you are doing the contouring with the ultrasound, and after starting insertion the needles, because of the edema from your experience, because it takes almost an hour to do this, so have you seen the changes in the the contouring once because of the edema because you are doing the yes. live imaging? Exactly. So in most cases, because again, because I say experience, because we managed to ensure that we re have that time reduced as much as possible to because of efficiency and training, we do see edema, but the edema is minimal. Um, the, usually why I'm asking is that, you know, is it affecting your DVH? Then let's on it. That's just my question. Okay, I see. So this is why when placing the needles or creating the pre-plan, you need to think about this um, a little bit in terms of how the prostate may change. So when I plan, I ensure you know, the peripheral needles are, are spaced well. So if the, patient, if the prostate does enlarge slightly, then I know those needles on the periphery will be sufficient in order to increase the dose 
uh, outwards, you know, by increasing the dual position. So I think about that more. So I don't position needles too much in the center. I space them out and I try to con con um, consider the periphery more. So these are the things you need to think about because when the, when the prostate does change and the contour changes, because you do your optimization after your second contour change. So then you can, you can account for this if your needles are, have been placed sensibly. However, if your needles haven't been placed sensibly in the beginning, then it's very difficult to bring that DVHs back or the coverage back. This is something you need to think about in the beginning. Um, maybe sometimes you may have a very, uh, sometimes a patient may be particularly bad in, in edema. In that case, there is nothing you can do. So I think I had one situation where the, the prostate enlarged so much, we had to abandon the treatment because the prostate, the, the, the needle arrangement wouldn't be sufficient to give them the dose. So they, they, the doctor, uh, in conjunction with physics, we, we decided there would be no benefit of what we were going to do. So this is a rare occasion, but it can happen. It's something that you need to consider in your risk assessments and your work procedures, how you would mitigate these things. Thank you. Uh, yes, the last um, question. If you don't mind. The okay. questions, there are some questions in the comment box. So I, will, I would like to go through those questions. And, uh, and after that, maybe you can ask the questions from audience. So you still have some time to okay. get some questions. Okay. So first of all, I would, I would like to thank you, Mr. Khalid, for his nice and well informative presentation. So there is a question from Deepika. What is the advantage of doing this prostate brachy? Because we treat with HDR only. So, sorry, just to understand the question, uh, what is the advantage of this? I don't understand the question also. So, what is the advantages of doing this prostate brachy? Because we okay. treat with HDR only. Okay. Okay. So, like I explained before, the advantage of prostate brachytherapy is that you are able to give a highly localized dose in a short period of time. That is the main advantage. Now, HDR only is still questionable because there is not enough data to show the prostate even if you created the plan you can still image you can still view the image you can still view the prostate to see has it changed so like we mentioned before um, one of the questions was about edema 
once we've created the plant, just before we start the treatment, we can still image to see has the images changed too much. With CT, you can't do this. The CT, you need to take the patient in that position, take them to a different room, CT them, and then bring them back. Now, in this time period, something may have changed. You, with the CT, you take a snapshot only in that time, and you can't revisit that CT. So this is the, the biggest kind of disadvantage of CT. The other uh, issue with- uh, Less is uh, the STS3 patients. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, the line the went a little bit. Is normally, is there bracket therapy we normally do for early stage prostate cancer? Okay. okay. So, uh, what is your opinion if there is patient with the last, I um, the later stage or the final oh. stage? Okay. Okay. So you need to think for these things. You need to think about the comorbidities. Um, the main thing is is the patient fit for the procedure, because the procedure itself is can be quite. Um, quite a big strain on the body. The general anesthetic itself is a big um, strain on the body. So it depends if the patient is able to, 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 to tolerate the procedure. The other thing to understand is, even if it's late stage, has, the, has the, the tumor or disease broken out of the prostate? Has it metastasized? If so, then HDR bracket therapy is not appropriate for that. It has to be localized within the prostate. Um, so these are the things to understand. Okay. Generally, with these patients. So, what type of QA is done? Okay, QA is a very important aspect in HDR prostate bracket therapy. So, thinking before, you have to do the QA in different stages depending on the equipment that you have. So, let's start with imaging. You have you have imaging QA. So, your ultrasound system has to have a full QA itself in terms of image quality, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know how it steps through the patient, um, the reconstruction what you're seeing is correct, what you're seeing is not correct, these things. Then you have the planning system itself. You need to have QA of the planning system in terms of your, your calculation model, your TG43, um, your contouring, you know, the, 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 the standard ways. The, then you have your afterloader itself, QA of the afterloader in terms of its stepping capabilities, the time it spends inside the patient, the do, you know, dwelt, you have to QA all these things. It's a, a quite a comprehensive QA schedule which needs to be carried out um, on, a, on a standard, you know, monthly, daily, weekly basis, as well as when you're doing QA before the patient. So in order to be able to, conf be able to confidently deliver such a treatment, you need to have a strong QA procedure because the thing you need to understand about brachytherapy afterloaders is that it's not a LINAC. The LINAC, you can switch the beam on and you can switch the beam off. Now with the afterloader, the source is always on. The radiation is always on. And if something goes wrong, and the, 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 the afterloader misbehaves, it's, it's, it's potentially a catastrophic situation. So a QA program has to be robust and correctly and, and periodically carried out in order to make sure these, these events don't happen. So any other questions from the audience? Uh, Khaled, yeah, the last question. Okay. Uh, well, from your experience, if you compare the LDR with the HDR, what do you say? Yeah. I mean, when is better? Okay. Or? So in my in my previous in, in the crystal, we did both LDR and HDR. The LDR treatments we did in a similar manner, but we used um, iodine seeds, and these were permanent. And specifically, we only did this for low dose, um, low risk patients. Now we haven't we hadn't at that time moved towards um, doing HDR for low risk patients two reasons. One reason, we were a very busy center. We already had many patients. And in order to establish one of these things, it takes time. And secondly, there isn't or wasn't enough data at the time or to, to, to compare with, to look at, to see how beneficial these things will be. Because generally with low risk patients, other approaches um, work sufficiently. Now, today I came across some studies where look who are looking at bracket therapy, uh, HDR bracket therapy. They are showing that actually it may be more beneficial for the patient instead of the LDR. So I can't really comment on that because in my experience, I've done both, but I haven't done one over the other. Uh, Khalid, last question. Uh, thank you for um, okay. your nice presentation. The last question is about um, the minimum threshold you are using for iridium 192, I mean, when you are going to stop that once it reaches the two curies, three curies, oh, which is the minimum so threshold? In my, in my previous center, because I was in the UK, we had a very good supply chain, etc. We had a three months. Every three months, we changed the, uh, we changed the source. 
I found that when, it, so for example, at the beginning, let's say the source was changed yesterday and today we are doing a prostate treatment. The treatment will, usually the treatment time itself, the, the time when the source is inside the patient, we're looking at between 12 to 15, 12 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes. Now the same plan in three months time goes up to 45 minutes, 50 minutes. So you need to think, it depends. You can use this iridium source for maybe a couple of more weeks longer. However, you need to think about this timing, you know, how long it takes, especially if it's yeah. a large prostate and you've got 18, maybe 20 needles, it can take a longer time. Personally, because that's I true. haven't... Actually, yeah, I was looking for any recommendation or any report from the WAP and that was the recommendation, what's the threshold, but I couldn't find. The, I don't think there is a consensus. There is no consensus about this. Um, there is, uh, I think you need to be careful on ter in terms of... It's a, it's a compromise between treatment time as well as staying within the regime of high dose rate because then you have this thing about going into medium dose rate and I don't understand the biology, the radiobiology enough to comment on these things. Because, yeah, the, the lower the dose rate, the lesser the radiobiological effects, but which is very low, but it's, it's been... It's yeah, been it's, I, I think the, the general kind of a no, um, knowledge or um, consensus in radiobiology is not very well understood especially when you move towards low and medium. So it's, it's, it's a difficult one to comment. And I think this may be the reason why there isn't much guidance out there. All right, thank you so much. Uh, okay, I, I would just like to ask uh, Mr. Khalid to say something about the complications or the side effects of this treatment. Because the, in the participant list, there are some uh, audience who are, the, who are at the early stage of their career, there are some students also. So could you please say something about the complications of so this treatment? These, generally for these patients, the toxicity and the outcomes have been shown to be excellent. Um, the side effects are extremely low. So for both LDR and HDR, the, the side effects are to do with urethra or rectum. Um, as long as these doses are kept to within the constraints specified, um, these patients are fine. Um, the other thing to understand is perforation of the urethra, perforation of the rectum. These are probably where the results of complications come from. Um, but generally though, for brachytherapy, HDR and LDR, the, the outcomes of these patients have been very well tolerated. Um, in, in my experience, the patient has their brachytherapy, for example, on a Monday morning, 8 a.m., we do the procedure and by the evening, by 5 p.m., the patient is ready to go home. 6 p.m., the patient is ready to go home. Um, they will have some pain, some soreness. Um, other than that, the patient is, is fully mobile, and a few days, they're completely recovered. Um, and in terms of toxicity, in terms of overall survival, the, the numbers themselves, they talk, they talk for this. If you look at the studies, you will see it shows um, in terms of that part, the quality of life. Um, Patients very, really very well tolerate this treatment, even elderly patients. Uh, well, we may find some uh, difficulties uh, like the urination or uh, bleeding uh, mm -hmm. with you know, or the stool or maybe the erectile disinfection. So yes. what is the, yeah, um, uh, I mean, what is the age of this patient? This kind of uh, side effects can be happening. I think it can happen to anybody. You need to understand the risk of these side effects is there for all patients. Um, the risks are low, but the risks are there. I guess this is probably dependent on um, experience, um, dependent on the procedure itself. Um, I can't really comment on a number. I don't know. I haven't seen any. I need to read some more studies to be able to tell you this. But it does come with experience. I guess for a new center, you need to take more time. You need to be more careful. But as, as you develop the knowledge, and the doctors develop the, the, you know, the experience of placing the needles, how they place the needles, you know, it improves. For example, in my center, when we have new doctors coming in or training, they take some time in pushing the needle inside. Sometimes they don't push it in in the correct place, so they have to take out and put in, take out and put in. So this can increase um, problems. It can increase uh, trauma within the prostate. I guess all these things come with experience. Again, I can't 100% comment on these things until I read, uh, read some more and direct it to some references. Okay, any more questions? Uh, if not, then I, uh, we would like to thank Mr. Khalid. Sorry, just the last one. Sorry. Eh? 
Yes. Okay. No, no, no problem. In terms of in terms of the dose constraints for both LDR and the HDR, are they same or they are, are they different? HDR and LDR, the dose constraints are similar. They're not the same. Similar. I'll have to look. I, like I said, it's been it's been nearly one year since I did these things because we haven't established a program here in Doha yet. So I will have to look in my notes. Um, it's, it's not at the top of my mind. They are, they are slightly different because oh, the, oh. the actual dose, um, the dose prescription is different. The dose prescription for the LDR is much higher because it's delivered over a long period of time. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is that, of course, the radiobiological equivalence equivalent doses will be the different because it's in, you know, gradually yeah. decreasing but for this case it's within it's all in one moment yeah. that's right i i have to look into my notes um i did get your message uh, I'm, you, you're more than welcome to send me an email and we can discuss this um later on sure thank you so much so thank you mr khalid for your nice presentation and you make this presentation interesting and well informative to us we and we believe that we'll get something uh, from your presentation we will try to uh, apply where we are working thank you thank you very much for having me here thank you very much for listening please um, excuse me for any mistakes i may have made and if there is any questions please feel free to email me i left my email on the presentation so i'm more than happy to discuss things and i'm also more importantly i'm 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 looking forward to learning from everybody else Okay, thank you all. Thank you for your participation. And we hope uh, in the next month we will uh, organize uh, another webinar with the different topics. And I believe all of you will join again. And I wish you your good health. Thank you all. Thank you very much for joining.